Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to you all, wherever you're tuning in from. Welcome to Facebook Neurology for Vets live webinar series, sponsored by Hallmark Veterinary Imaging. This is our end of summer special. Uh, we're not quite ready for Christmas yet, but our guest promised us to deliver an early present, apparently. So let's wait for that. Uh, Laurent and I are very pleased to welcome our guest, Dr. Emily Alcavero y Bala. How did I do? How did I do? Oh, okay. Sometimes my pronunciation is offensive. I try my best. Uh, he's a good friend of the team here. So let me give you um, an overview of our esteemed speaker today, another rising star of the profession. Uh, Emily graduated from Universita Autonoma de Barcelona. It's okay. Uh, in, uh, in in 20, 2011. Hello to uh, all the team at Barcelona there. Um, and um, Emily credits his love of neurology to Drs. Vicente Ajigil. Sorry, that's why it's very terrible. And Marty Bumarola. That one was a little easier. Uh, yeah. Through those people, he developed a passion for neurology. Um, if you don't know who those people are, it's probably because of the way I pronounced it. But anyway, um, um, he undertook a rotating internship at the Hospital Clinic Veterinary at the same veterinary school uh, in Barcelona. Uh, he undertook a um, um, neurology externship in the UK and in the USA. Um, so he's been everywhere. Um, worked for two years as an out-of-hours vet in Mataro. Barcelona and then moved to the United Kingdom in 2016. He initially worked in a first opinion practice in Liverpool and then performed a neurology internship at the Animal Health Trust uh, in Newmarket, a uh, place we know well. From 2017 to 2020, uh, Emily uh, completed his residency in neurology at the Small Animal Teaching Hospital at the University of Liverpool. So hello to the team at Liverpool and he became a diplomat um, for uh, in ECVN in 2021. Uh, Emily worked for nearly four years at Chester Gates Veterinary Specialist. Hello, Chester Gates. Uh, and in 2024, he moved back to his home country, Catalonia. Emily wrote this. Uh, and is currently working at, uh, I'm not getting into trouble, at Ars Venaria in Barcelona. Uh, today, Emily is going to talk about his recent publication on the clinical and MRI findings of the Racalumba hydrated nucleus pulposus extrusions and intervertebral disc extrusions in dogs. So thanks very much, Emily, for uh, for giving up your time and coming here. We're, we're very honoured and looking forward to hearing about your study. Thanks, Simon and Lauren, and thanks for inviting me here. The honour is only mine for being here with you guys. Can you see my screen okay? You, want to, uh, you need to share it, um, Emily. Oh, sorry. There no. we go. Yeah. Now, over to you. Great, perfect. So yeah, as I was saying, thanks very much. And yes, today we're gonna I'm gonna present this um, project that we did with the colleagues at Chester Gates and at Dovco and Veterinary Hospital with my friend Sergio Gomez and all the other co-authors, which is Thoracolumba hydrated nucleus pulposus extrusion and intervertebral disc extrusions in dogs. And we'd like we wanted to compare not only the clinical presentation but also the MRI findings. So um, I'd like to introduce or to mention something which or a few terms and concepts which may be a bit basic for someone but since we have a I guess a wide range variety of um, specialization knowledge that's in our audience I'd like to introduce this term that is used I guess in most English speaking countries even owners even carers of patients come with I, my dog has IVDD or this disease because they see this term very often on Google or 
um, Facebook uh, forums and stuff like that. But intervertebral disc disease is a very broad and not really specific term because it includes um, several types of problems or se several types of diseases, if you would like. So we can have, as an IVDD, clinical disc herniation. We may have as well subclinical disc herniation, or we can have sometimes as well intervertebral disc degeneration without herniation. So intervertebral disc disease may mean a lot, but may not mean too much. We, ha we have to be more specific because actually, if we talk about disc herniation, if we and if we include different types and subtypes, we may find in the literature up to nine different types. The first, uh, or the two classic historical ones, which are disc extrusion or Hansen type 1 disc herniation and disc protrusion or Hansen type 2 disc um, herniation are the ones that have been known and studied and treated for longer. But we have as well recently maybe more um, subtypes, especially based on MRI findings, most of them. One of them is disc extrusions with extensive epidural hemorrhage in medium in large breed dogs, small dogs as well. We have traumatic disc extrusions, acute and compressive Neurocos pulposus extrusions, which some people may call Hansen type 3 disc extrusions or herniations, which is a wrong term, okay, because in this case we don't have disc degeneration. Then hydrated Neurocos pulposus extrusions, which are the, the, the scope of this study and this presentation. Intradural extramedullary disc extrusions, intradural intramedullary disc extrusions, and then as well foraminal and paralateral disc extrusions. So, here, also, some very basic uh, concepts and parts of this structure called the intervertebral disc. I hope that you can see my arrow. We have, in a disc, we have the annulus fibrosis, represented as AF here, okay? And, which, when we talk to clients, we say that it's this kind of donut-like kind of onion rings. And then inside, we've got the jam inside the donut, which is the nucleus pulposus. Okay, we can see it here as well, the annulus fibrosus and the nucleus Pulposes. They're not represented here, but we have as well the transitional zone, which is the area that transitions from the nucleus pulposus to the annulus fibrosus, and then the cartilaginous end plates in the actual vertebral end plates. And with time and with age, as we age, this structure, the disc, can degenerate. Okay, we can see a non degenerate disc and a progressive degeneration of the disc. So this may happen, as I said, with age, but it may happen prematurely or very early in dogs that suffer from chondrodystrophy or in chondrodystrophic breeds. And this is an important concept and thing that we'll mention later. So if we talk about all these types of disc disease or disc herniations, uh, they've been broadly studied and um, described in different papers and especially this clinical reasoning, reasoning done by the RVC and with the, different types of diseases that I find very useful, but we know about most of them, their typical signal men, typical ages and breeds that are represented with some types of disc and disease, how the clinical history is, some of are a bit more chronic, some, some of them are pre-acute, how they present, if they present um, uh, the onset of the clinical signs is associated to a traumatic event, the common or the most common types of neurological examination, some of them may present with severe neurological um, dysfunction, some of them are not painful, some of them are. We know as well um, in terms of diagnosis, especially when we talk about um, diagnostic imaging, their common features. We know as well how to treat them, the, um, the successful outcome with surgery, without surgery. Some of the disc herniations are actually non-surgical diseases. And for most of them, we know as well prognosis and outcome. Here you have some examples, by all means there's many more than this, but just to give you a little kind of some examples of different types of disc disease and herniations. But if we focus on the um, topic of our study, which are hydrated nucleus pulposus extrusions, these are maybe a bit more, um, have been recently documented in the literature. Recently, I mean the last 15 to 20 years. In the beginning, they used to be called intraspinal or even discal cysts. However, that was seen later on, I'll mention it now, that they were not really cysts. The first um, big case series was this one of the Journal of Small Animal uh, Practice in 2012 by Elsa Beltran. Uh, and they were 
here they were describing mostly cervical um, HNMPs, okay? So cervical hydrated mucus pulposus extrusions. And they said that they had this typical seagull sign because of the meningovertebral ligament here, okay? And it became kind of a typical image on transverse situated images, okay? So these type of these herniations happen because there is an acute herniation of hydrated or at least not fully degenerated, so only partially degenerated nucleus pulposus, okay? And this causes spinal cord compression, but it also, also causes contusion, okay? And from there, there were several um, case series studies, mostly or most of them focusing on hydrated nucleus pulposus extrusions happening in the cervical spine. In this one here at the bottom by Christian Falsone, the, it's an interesting one because there was an examination, cytological examination and histopathological examination to show that actually this term cysts was not right. Okay, so they were actually um, nucleus pulposus material which was not fully degenerated, or, or in some cases it was almost fully hydrated. Yeah, so this term spinal cyst should be not used anymore. As I said, mostly in the literature, uh, the hydrated nucleus pulposus extrusions have been reported in the cervical spine. Here there's a nice study uh, from a couple of years ago in which they compared cervical cases and thracolumbar cases, and they could see some differences. They could see that in thracolumbar hydrated nucleus pulposus extrusions, there was more commonly pain. There was more commonly lateralization of the disc material. There were more chondrodystrophic breeds represented or affected by this, and the onset of the clinical science was mostly or more commonly associated with activity compared to um, cervical cases. And you can see an, an example here. You can see on the right that the material is mostly uh, lateralized or ventrolateral compared to the very centrally located cervical um, disc. Okay, and this as well, this interesting um, study in which they compared cervical hydrated nucleus pulposus extrusion with other cervical compressive myelopathies. And here they put, as you can see here on the bottom right, Hansen type 1 disc extrusions or Hansen type 1 disc herniations, Hansen type 2 disc herniations or protrusions, and they put as well cervical spondylomyelopathy or wobblers. And they compared the presentation of the hydrated nucleus pulposus extrusions with all the rest. And they could see that hydrated nucleus pulposus extrusions had more severe neurological dysfunction and less hyperesthesia than all the other diseases and all the other conditions. We know as well, although it's not really the topic of, the, of our study, it was not, that mm, dogs with this mm, type of disc disease, hydrated nucleus pulposus extrusion, whether you treat them conservatively or surgically, the outcome is very similar. And as you can see, the outcome is very good from, I would say, excellent for most of these cases. And they only need hmm, from two to 12 days to ambulate if you treat them conservatively and if you treat them with surgery from five to 10. So actually it doesn't make loads of difference whether you treat them uh, with surgery or without surgery. Although then case by case, you need to assess the hmm, immediate short-term uh, progression and how they clinically evolve. But anyway, it's an important thing to bear in mind because this may be very different from other types of disc diseases or disc herniations. So our project, what did we want to do? We wanted, or our aims were to analyze the clinical presentation and also the imaging characteristics of dogs with thoracolumbar hydrated nucleus pulposus extrusions. And we wanted to compare these with another type of very common disc herniation, which are disc extrusions. And why did we want to do it like this? Because as I said, in hydrating nucleus pulposus extrusions, probably there's two important roles in the disease. Or this material has a role of contusing or bruising the spinal cord, but also compressing it. And this may be quite similar, might be, to disc herniations, or sorry, to disc extrusions, in which there, there is also compression of the spinal cord and contusion. This is why we wanted to compare these two mm, pathological entities, if you like. And we had some hypotheses. We thought that compared to, do to those with thracolumbar disc extrusion, disc extrusions, dogs with thracolumbar hydrated nucleus pulposus extrusions would be older dogs. They would be both chondrodystrophic and non-chondrodystrophic. They would have a more acute onset of clinical signs 
they would probably have less hyperesthesia, more severe neurological dysfunction, and less spinal cord compression. So, in the materials and methods, uh, that was a bicentric case control retrospective study. That were cases from Chestergate Veterinary Specialists and from Dovergold Veterinary Hospital. We had the ethical approval by the CVS Ethics Committee, and we collected cases from May 2011 to January 2023. In the inclusion criteria, we, inc we included dogs with, of course, arthrocolumbar myelopathy that had complete medical history, neurological examination, and, of course, dogs that had an MRI on, of the arthrocolumbar spine with at least a T2 sagittal and a T2 transverse, T2 transverse sequences with, of course, diagnosis of hydrated nucleus purpose extrusion or diagnosis of intervertebral disc extrusion based on previously uh, published studies and, and cases. Here, you, you've got two examples. On the top, there's a hydrated nucleus purpose extrusion, which you can see here, the sagittal and the transverse. And here we have a sagittal T2 and a transverse T2, the other ones were also T2, of a disc extrusion. And the exclusion criteria was not having complete medical records. We excluded cases which were L7S1 disc herniations because maybe uh, slightly different pathology and by all means cases that didn't have a diagnosis of either uh, nucleus pulpus extrusion or disc extrusion. So uh, when we included the animals, what did we examine? We examined or we recorded their signalment, especially when we talk about the breed whether they were chondrodystrophic or non chondrodystrophic, their body weight, whether the onset was acute or per acute, we put it like this to make it easier, so less than 40 hours, or chronic, the duration in days of clinical signs, the progression of the clinical signs from the onset to the presentations, whether the signs were progressive, stable, or improving. We tried to look into the clinical history, whether there was any history of traumatic event or vigorous exercise, exercise when there was the onset of the clinical signs, and whether there was any vocalization, yelping, or screaming um, recorded. On the neurological presentation, we, of course, recorded the neurological status, and we used this um, grading um, published by Scott in 1997 from grade one to grade five, as you many of you know, but I put it here just in case. And also, we tried to have a look on the medical record whether there was hyperesthesia, so spinal pain or hyperalgesia, recorded on the presentation. In terms of imaging, what did we look at? So, the location of the disc herniation, and we classified based on previous studies whether the extrusion was in the thracolumbar area from T9 to 10, from T9 to T10 to L1, L2, mid lumbar from L2 to L3 to L4, L5 and caudal lumbar L5, L6, or L6, L7. We also had a look at the degree of degeneration of the um, nucleus pulposus in situ in the actual disc space, based on this um, study from a few years ago by Sarah Longo. So we, here we, A was no degeneration. You can see that the nucleus pulposus is fully T2 hyperintense. Here there is partial degeneration. It's mm, quite high point intense, but still there's some preservation of this slight dark gray, or this one, which is full degeneration, okay? Then we also assessed whether there was narrowing of the disc space. That was, of course, a subjective thing, but we had to, we wanted to check it on the sagittal images. We also wanted to check whether there was a reduction of volume of the nucleus pulposus. Also, in terms of imaging, and we talked specifically about the herniated disc material, we wanted to see whether there was lateralization of the extruded herniated material or not. If there was extension beyond the intervertebral disc space, here there's an example. This is a sagittal image of an L5, L6 disc extrusion. And as you can see, the material does not sit only dorsal to the intervertebral disc space, but there is also extension of the material. We also wanted to check whether there was material on the intervertebral foramen, where the material was based um, or in, in respect to the spinal cord, whether it was only ventral or ventrolateral or lateral dorsal, which was less common we seen actually, I'm not sure if there was any case that had it dorsally located, but it could happen. So we wanted to check all this. And by all means, we wanted to check as well the signal intensity of the herniated disc material, whether it was uh, T1 hyper or hypo or iso intense. We also checked it on 
on T2 and, and gradient echo or T2 star, and whether there was contrast enhancement or not, by all means, in cases in which contrast had been administered. Other things that we wanted to check on the imaging was how the overlying spinal cord was. The degree of compression, measurement of the diameter of the non-compressed spinal cord, the site of maximum compression with basic maths and a basic formula. We also wanted to check if there was intramedullary T2 hyperintensity, okay? And we wanted to check as well, we wanted to see how the apaxial musculature was because there's studies with um, cases of intervert intervertebral disc extrusions and also inflammatory myelopathies in which um, apaxial muscle hyperintensities, especially on stir, have been reported. So we also wanted to have a look at this. Then, uh, thank, I would like to use this opportunity to say thank you to Imogen Schofield because she helped a lot with the statistics, but I'll, I'll mention a few things about that. I hope that you don't ask me many questions about statistics because I'm, I'm not good at them at all. So the Throcolumba hydrated nucleus purpose extrusion were actually the cases, and the disc extrusions or the Hansen type 1 disc herniations were deemed controls. So we calculated or Imogen ca calculated to in order to have and 95% of confidence and 80% of statistical power, we needed a ratio of controls to cases of two to one, okay? For continuous variables, we use the shapiro wilk test. For categorical data, the T-squared test. And if we had less than five dogs per category, we use the Fisher's exact test. We set the statistical significance at a P lower than 0.05. And when we had variables that were mm, close to being maybe statistically significant, so less than 0.2, we did as well the multivariable analysis. So results, uh, we managed to recruit 156 dogs, 51 with hydrated nucleus purpose extrusions and 105 with intervertebral disc herniation and extrusion, sorry, all from the same uh, study period. And if we start mentioning differences in the signalman and the weight, so we saw that um, dogs with a columbar hydrated nucleus pulposus extrusion were significantly younger than, um, sorry, older than dogs with disc herniation or with Hansen type 1 disc extrusions. Sorry about that, <laughs> of the uh, confusion with the name. We also saw that dogs with disc extrusions or Hansen type 1 disc, herni disc herniations were lighter significantly lighter than dogs with hydrated nucleus purpose extrusions. And also, which was one of the things that we wanted to study, there were way many more um, chondrostrophic dogs in the group of intervertebral disc extrusions than in the dogs with in hydrated nucleus purpose extrusions. So that was a significant thing, as you can see. 62% of the hydrated nucleus purpose extrusion dogs were chondrostrophic. Um, and in the intervertebral disc extrusion group, there were 91%. But surprisingly, the most commonly represented breeds in the disc extrusion group were Dachshunds and French Bulldogs, also crossbreed dogs. And in the hydrated nucleus purpose extrusion, the most common breeds were Cockapoos, um, Cocker Spaniels, and also crossbreed dogs. If we talk about the history and neurological findings, the here there were some 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 items that were quite significantly different, and I will mention mostly the ones that were that met um, st statistical significance, because if we have to go through all of them, we'll be here all night. But basically, there was a per acute to acute onset in 90% of the um, hydratic uh, nucleus purpose extrusion dogs, whereas the onset was per acute or acute in less than 62% of the intervertebral disc extrusion dogs. So here there was clinic and um, statistical significance. Also, something um, statistically significant was the presence of a traumatic event or vigorous exercise at, exercise at the moment of onset, more commonly found in hydrated nucleus purpose extrusions than in intervertebral disc extrusions. Also, vocalization. It was more common to have a dog or a patient yelping or vocalizing when there was hydrated nucleus purpose extrusion than when there was a intervertebral disc extrusion. Another interesting and different thing was the deterioration. It was way more common to see a deterioration of the neurological status in dogs with Hansen type 1 disc herniations or disc extrusions than in dogs with hydrated nucleus purpose extrusions. In these dogs as well, the clinical history or the, yeah, the history or the duration of the clinical signs was shorter compared 
to the history, clinical history of dogs with Hansen type 1 disc herniations. In terms of um, ambulatory status, there was no clinical, uh, there was no, sorry, statistical uh, significance, but there were more non ambulatory dogs in the disc extrusion group than in the hydrated disc group. And another significant difference was the presence of hyperesthesia. 72% of dogs with disc extrusion, Hansen type 1 disc herniations, had pain on presentation, whereas only just above half of dogs with hydrated nucleus pulposus extrusions had uh, hyperesthesia. In terms of MRI uh, findings, these are not really all that, um, I'm not going to say significant, they don't shed loads of light, um, light on these conditions because we know already or we knew that um, the material of hydrated nucleus pulposus extrusions are way more hyperintense on T2 because they are hydrated or not fully degenerated material, but we make it more obvious by, by showing it, I guess, because as you can see, none of them was hyperintense on T2. They were mostly hyperintense on gradient echo as well. We compare it to the, um, to the disc extrusion ones. And um, so these are basically to exemplify that we're talking about different pathologies, but here we didn't really want to work out or make an um, emphasis or on any kind of statistical significance, just to exemplify that there are different conditions. Here we wanted to, yes, to share with you, or I wanted to share with you some of these uh, differences. So, um, hydrated nucleus pulposus extrusions happen mostly, as you can see, over 90% of them in the Thracolumbar region, and that met statistical difference and, and significance. Uh, because there was many other, there were many other dogs and cases with intervertebral disc extrusions that had the herniations in the mid lumbar or caudal lumbar spine. Also, the lateralization of the herniated material. Almost 90% of the of um, this material in cases with intervertebral disc extrusions were lateralized. Okay, they were worse on one side than on the other. Whereas um, in almost 30% of hydrated nucleus pulposus extrusions, the disc or the material was very centered, really not lateralized one side more than the other. The degeneration, as you can see, there was degeneration in of the nucleus pulposus in all cases with hydrated nucleus pulposus extrusion, whereas 40% of the cases with hydrated nucleus pulposus extrusion had, extrusion had no degeneration of the nucleus pulposus. The extension of the material beyond the intervertebral disc space, there was also a significance here because in hydrated nucleus pulposus extrusion, the material used to, or seemed to, to, to stages confined dorsal to the um, disc space. However, on the disc extrusion or hence the bone disc herniation, the material seemed to spread beyond the disc space. In these cases as well, in the disc extrusion cases, it was more common to find material in the foramen and the compression was also quite significantly different. As a, this is a, a median, in disc extrusions, there was a 51% of spinal cord compression, whereas on hydrated nucleus pulposus extrusion, the median of spinal cord compression didn't really reach 35%. Also, a different, an important difference. And the last one, which is the intramedullary hyperintensity, which then we'll, we'll discuss whether this could be contusion or edema or We'll, we'll mention that in a second, there was more commonly um, intermediary hyperintensity in cases with intervertebral disc extrusions than in cases with um, hydrated nucleus pulposus extrusions. So if we talk about the discussion, and I'll try to get the, at least the most important ones, uh, dogs with thracolumba hydrated nucleus pulposus extrusions were older and less likely to be chondrodystrophic than dogs with thracolumba disc extrusions. So, Important things to mention here, or things that we mm, try to make um, out of this. Mm, we know that the disc, the structure, the disc as a structure, it ages with age, of course. And one of the things that may happen or may explain why all the dogs had hydrated nucleus pulposus extrusions were because probably the annulus fibrosus gets clefts, the fibers disperse a little bit, and they get separated, which means that the annulus fibrosus becomes weaker, and this is why there is extrusion of the nucleus pulposus, because actually, this nucleus pulposus, in theory, is a bit healthier, a bit more hydrated than in dogs with chondrodystrophy, which also explains why we had more uh, chondrodystrophic dogs and dog breeds 
in the intervertebral disc extrusion group and younger dogs because as you know this fgf4 retrogene which is in the chromosome 12 uh, causes chondrodystrophy and it causes early degeneration of the disc so early dehydration and degeneration of the nucleus pulposus so this may explain this first important difference also thracolumbar hydrated nucleus pulposus extrusions had a more acute onset they had as well shorter clinical history and the onset was more likely linked with exercise and vocalization than dogs with intervertebral disc extrusion. And we know that this may, we suppose that this happens because um, there's, when there is uh, jumping or there is vigorous exercise, this kind of um, increase of discal, intradiscal pressure because of these superphysiological forces. And this causes the sudden extrusion of um, material, which, yes, it's material that is not fully degenerate. But we've said in the previous slide that probably this um, annulus fibrosus starts to be a bit weaker. Okay, so this causes this acute and very sudden onset of clinical signs. Since the, the clinical signs are more acute or per acute, probably this is why the clinical history or the yeah the, the clinical history is shorter because dogs get get taken to the vet much quicker than if the if the onset is a bit less acute. Also, this may explain why the vast majority, around 90% of the disc extrusions of, circle of hydrated nucleus pulposus extrusions happen between T9 and L2, because of course there is a greater mobility. The thoracic spine is way more rigid, we have the ribs as well, whereas the thoracolumbar area is very mobile, it's a bit more bendy, and any traumatic event, any vigorous exercise can cause or can increase this um, intradiscal pressure and cause the hydrated nucleus pulposus extrusion. Another, another thing, thracolumbar hydrated nucleus pulposus extrusions were uh, less likely to present with worsening of the clinical signs when we compare them with disc extrusion dogs. And probably this is explained because there was less degree of spinal cord compression and, and contusion, okay? The more compression we have, probably, and the more contusion we have, it is more likely that we cause, <coughs> excuse me, edema within the spinal cord parenchyma, and these may cause um, worsening of the clinical signs and worsening of the neurological stages. We know, thanks to this work by Angela Fada on the JVAM in 2013, and thanks to this work by Christian Falsone in 2016, that in both um, epidural spaces, in the epidural space of dogs with intervertebral disc extrusion, and in dogs with and hydrated nucleus pulposus extrusions in both of them, there is inflammation. There's neutrophilic inflammation or there is mixed inflammation. There's macrophages, there's neutrophils, etc. But we know as well that the material of intervertebral disc extrusions is material which is way more dense, thicker. Sometimes that can be as well hemorrhage, and these may cause irritation of the meninges. It can cause as well axonal swelling, and it may cause this degeneration. Whereas the material of hydrating nucleus pulposus extrusion is way softer material, easier to disperse. It doesn't cause so much compression and the volume is probably smaller. Okay, so this is why probably there is less, um, commonly there is less, it's less common for dogs to present with a worsening and um, clinical course. Also, dogs with hydrating nucleus pulposus extrusions had less hyperesthesia and they were more likely to be ambulatory than dogs with intervertebral disc extrusion. As I've just said, um, there is less material in the intervertebral foramen. So if there's less material in, in the intervertebral foramen, probably there is less irritation of the nerve root, which may cause less pain. There is less compression, which means that the meninges may have less volume of material there and um, pressing on it, irritating it, hence less, less pain. And as I've said as well, the material there in hydrated nucleus pulposus extrusion is softer, more hydrated, it disperses, and also there is less extension of the disc material. As we, as you may remember, in a hydrated nucleus pulposus extrusions, the material was more likely confined to the um, just dorsal to the intervertebral disc space, whereas in intervertebral disc extrusions, the material was more likely to be spread, causing more compression, more irritation, and going to the foramen as well, hence why uh, more hyperesthesia in these cases are more likely to be and more likely to be non-ambulatory. 
So if we take into account the hypothesis that we had, uh, we probably confirmed that almost all of them were true. One of them was not. Okay, so yes, docked with um, hydrated nucleus propulsion extrusions were older. They were both chondrostrophic and non chondrostrophic breeds, especially when compared to the other group. The onset of the clinical signs was more acute. They were less commonly less uh, yeah less commonly painful, and they had less spinal cord compression. However, there was more severe neurological dysfunction, although that was not statistically significant in the um, intervertebral disc extrusion group. By all means, as in any study, there's limitations. In ours, there were limitations as well. The fact that it's retrospective, the fact that it's multicentric, many of these cases, all of these cases, we had to retrieve medical records and clinical histories from referring vets where sometimes not everything may be written down or there's specific things that may not be written down. So that's, of course, a limitation. The MRI scanners, there were low field MRIs and high field MRIs. Probably the low field MRIs, the quality and the definition may not be as good as the high field ones. So that's another limitation. We're putting here, we're including only cases that were seen at referral hospitals, which may not represent the entire canine population of dogs with these two conditions, disc extrusions and hydrated disc extrusions. And in some of them, there was lack of definitive diagnosis because they may not be treated surgically, or if they were treated surgically, maybe not all the cases really, because that wasn't the focus of our study, were histopathologically examined. So to conclude and the take home message, if we compare to dogs with a hydrated nucleus pulpus extrusion, if we compare them to disc extrusion dogs, we know that these are older, they can be both chondrodystrophic but also non chondrodystrophic The clinical sign, signs tend, tend to be pre-acute or acute and commonly associated with a traumatic event with vigorous exercise and with vocalization, with the helping. On presentation, they are less painful than dogs with intervertebral disc extrusions. The clinical histories are shorter. They mostly happen in the thoracolumbar junction. And when we do the MRIs, amongst many other findings, the spinal cord compression is definitely less. So that's me, thank you very much. I wanted to thank Anna, Simone and Marco. I wanted, Marco Ruggeri, I wanted to thank Sergio Gomez, Mark Lowry, Imogen Schofield, and here I've put as well my little um, thank you to Linda Griffiths and Joe Seagrave and Pablo uh, Menendez from Justigates from the imaging team. That's it, thank you very much. And um, we had a great audience, more than 100 people, you know, listening to your presentation and was quite amazed the area of, you know, geography. Um, while we wait for a few questions, we had people, uh, to give you an idea, uh, Emily from Madagascar, Djibouti, Colombia, Latvia, Canada, Thailand. Uh, oh. We even have people from Mexico um, as well and uh, Zambia. So. Uh, I'm only mentioning the people that have commented, but, um, you know, great presentation. Let's take a few questions. I've got the easy uh, job, as you can see. I don't have to uh, 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 embarrassing myself trying to pronounce any Spanish name. Much easier. Uh, Roman, um, there is mostly question about treatment, which I have to say is really an interesting topic. Yeah. Uh, this um, hydrated disc. Any difference in surgery versus medical management in the hydrated nucleus pulposus cohort? So, to be fair with you, uh, we didn't study this. Maybe it will be another it will be part two of our study, and we will let you know, Roman. But no, we didn't study this. That was not the aim. It was only the actual clinical presentation, then treatment outcomes and prognosis. Maybe we talk about this another day. But sorry, we didn't study this in, in this specific study. So not to let you get away with that, uh, <laughs> I think it's more you as a neurologist. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, I have to say, as I, I still sit on the fence personally. Um, you know, you have a case. Yeah. When are you going to advise your client? Let's take him to theatre, or actually sit tight. He's going to get better. Do you have any anything to suggest? 
to be honest, and yes, this is basically basically based on my experience, uh, which is much shorter than Laurent's and Simon's by all means, and also based on trying to be very evidence based, like Laurent said. I the first advice is probably to sit and wait. However, since at the end of the day, we vets or vet neurologists, yes, we treat animals, but we treat people, and we treat or we try to manage people's expectations how impatient they are for a recovery, how how long they want to wait. So it really depends because based on the studies, treating these dogs medically or uh, surgically, the outcome is exactly the same really because what happens here, probably mo one of the most important roles, and hopefully with the studies I've presented that was more emphasized, probably is not really the compression on the spinal cord, it's the contusion. So with surgery, the only thing that we can achieve is decompression. With the surgery, we don't remove any contusion. We don't remove any bruising. The bruising has to follow its course. We can help with probably anti-inflammatories, time, but that's about it. Different thing, although it, it, it's not the aim of, that was not the uh, the study. I'm a bit more cautious, I'm not sure, Logan and Simon, with cervical discs. Because when this hydrating nucleus and pulpose exclusions happen in, this, in the cervical spinal cord, there's also the worry that they will affect maybe the spinal cord segment of the phrenic nerve or dogs will go into re, into respiratory distress. So this is maybe slightly different. I'm, I would be probably less strict of, I would just sit and wait. In this case, it's maybe a bit, uh, if dogs present tetraplegic with abdominal breathing, maybe in this case, uh, yes, I would go to try to achieve decompression as quick as I can. But for, for Thracolumbo ones, I would give time, but again, based on or depending on how the dog presents, how impatient the owner is, and wants results now, now, now. You know what I mean? So I have no black or white answer, yes or no, for this. I certainly remember, I mean, it's one, you can't make a rule. Um, reported an MRI of a dog with a cervical hydrated nucleus pulposis extrusion, um, non-ambulatory. The vet decided to wait, um, and then the dog get, got worse neurologically and repeated the MRI. And you could see definitely the extension of the intramedullary chain. So, is one case. Um, I I don't know. I, I will be tempted to cut this dog if they are non-ambulatory, uh, especially in the neck. But again, whether or not they would have done better, uh, the same if you didn't do surgery. I don't know. But that would be my my take on it. Um, a few more questions. Any criteria during surgery? To be extra sure that you remove all the disc if it's a um, you know an hydrated one um so well um the volume in these cases that's an important thing i guess to mention and the, the ones that i've operated you can see that they're very watery very gelatinous and sometimes with the suction you you get them out very nicely you don't have the same probably rewarding satisfaction that you have with an Hansen type 1 disc exclusion where sometimes there's loads of volume with a nerve hook you can remove a lot. Sometimes in these cases like you go in and you go, oh, what's that all? And you get a bit, oh fine, okay. But it's 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 different. Fenestration, I would use probably the same rationale and criterion that you would use for disc extrusions. At the end of the day, the anus fibrosis probably has ruptured or has ruptured, has uh, torn. So maybe I guess it's safe if you have time, if the anesthesia is okay, if the app access is doable to do a fenestration there's the risks associated to fenestration are so low that i guess not doing a fenestration sometimes there's not loads of reasons but it's a personal opinion of course I'm going to take a few more questions yeah. um do you did you see um tora colomba h and e with deep end negative um do you see some um, comparison regarding the mri contrast announcement between the hydrated and the you know more classical expression so the first question and i didn't mention it sorry because it didn't meet statistical significance is that only one of out of the 51 cases with hydrated nucleus pulpose extrusion was grade five so paraplegic without nociception which is i don't know what percentage it was very low percentage one out of 51 whereas in disc extrusions or in classic disc uh, hands and type 1 herniations, there were many more. So that didn't meet statistical significance, but there was only one. Um, and then the contrast enhancement, uh, if I could not put it, I should read it again, but no, it didn't meet um, statistical difference. No, it was very similar distributed. Plus, also important that not in all MRIs, there was contrast because most of these cases, you don't need to put contrast. Sometimes you only put it if you have, well, what, what was that really? 
but no, it didn't meet any, there was no huge difference in between them, no. In your study, you didn't analyze the association between the degree of cord compression and the neurological grade. So with um, this exclusion, we know that the degree of compression is not associated with the severity of the sign. In your experience, is cord compression in uh, the hydrated one associated with severity? Yeah, at the beginning, we wanted to do this and match one group, um, match them a little bit and see the degrees of compression and uh, se severity of the neurological dysfunction, but we didn't do it because probably would have biased too much. It would have been very difficult to be uh, random in this case. But I probably my conclusions based on this, if you like, small population of of dogs, or based only in this study, that the, the degree of compression probably has nothing to do with the with the neurological dysfunction because probably based on all what we've said so far with Lauren as well, the major role of neurological dysfunction in these cases is probably the contusion, not the, probably not, not the compression. But we didn't study either if the intramedullary hyperintensity or the degree of it or the severity of it was associated with more or with less neurological dysfunction. So probably the, the answer would be the same as to um, what we know about intervertebral disc exclusions, that degree of compression sometimes has nothing to do with neurological rate. Two more questions. Yeah. What's your thought on prophylactic fenestration of the adjacent disc for um, hydrated um, exclusion case? As I said, I think that I would use the same rational. I, especially since that study um, by um, Paul Freeman in Cambridge, uh, in which they checked how much material you push up after doing a fenestration. To be fair, I only fenestrate the discs dorsal to which there is a laminectomy. I don't, I am a bit cautious and wary fenestrating discs above which there is, I have no access to check the spinal cord because you can push some material up. I think that in that study was seven out of 21 cases that after fenestrating you would you push material up. So basically I would use the same rationale. Um, the affected disc, and if time is okay with anesthesia, if the dog's fine, if it's easy access to the annulus fibrosus, I would probably fenestrate and check afterwards. But I'm not sure that I would uh, like, I think that, well, I think that I've come to this conclusion that I don't like fenestrating discs above which I cannot check the vertebral canal. I think that it's an, an unnecessary risk. It's a shame that you would push more material up. I would just add for, you know, um, say we asked the question, um, I don't think there's a place to fenestrate if it is a non chondrodystrophic breed. Um, so if it's a non chondrodystrophic breed, the discs are usually hydrated or you know minimally degenerated. There's absolutely no rationale there uh, to do it. You know, so um, the answer is probably no to to the question there. Um, the last question. Um, I think Ian put a, a, a good point here is you know if it is traumatic um taking into account that in theory you know we've got the sinus just above the disc obviously they are more divergent at the level of the disc why we don't see more hemorrhage there but it may be due to the fact that the, the sinus are more divergent at the level of the disc i presume but i don't know yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a good question i i'm not sure to, to be fair with you probably the fact that there is less volume and the volume is a bit softer it may not be <clears throat> strong enough or solid or firm enough to actually cause the laceration of the sinus. I don't know. That's a good point. And also, yes, um, I didn't, we didn't think about this, to be honest with you. But yeah, like Logan said, it may be this, that the, yeah, the distribution of the sinus may be a bit different. Or I think that the volume has a lot to do with it. The, the amount of nucleus pulposus that extrudes and compresses the cord is so little. That maybe this is why, because I, in none of these um, cases that we had here, there was any, median, yeah, no, there was no gradient echo signal void, or, or even in the ones that we did surgery on, I don't recall any blood in any of them, actually. No. Usually very well confined as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I think we're going to uh, leave you now, and uh, you know, again, great presentation, Emily, and thanks for mm -hmm. taking the time. Um, out of, you know, obviously after a day of clinic. Um, Simon, you got the last word if you want to let people know when will be the next.
presentation. Yeah, thanks very much, Emily. Um, really fascinating talk and great study um, and uh, really well laid out. So I appreciate you taking the time to do that. Uh, uh, really good to listen to. Uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And thanks to Hallmark Veterinary Imaging again for sponsorship. Uh, we'll post this lecture um, on our website and on our podcast site. We'll let you know about that. Um, and we'll see you back in early November for the last session of the year. Uh, and until then, uh, enjoy neurology. Stay safe. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you. Bye.